Before we dive into this panel, I think it, our, our keynotes and Econ actually help tee up some of the issues that, that this panel is going to talk about in terms of evolving national and international norms in security and privacy law. Um, the challenges, as Cindy outlined, are, are immense. Think of a whole wide world of differing laws with differing philosophies about privacy, about security, about personal freedoms. And rather than take away from this panel, rather than introduce the panelists individually, I want to maximize their time by just having them introduce themselves. But I do want to point one thing out that hopefully you've noticed is a reoccurring theme of Summit this year. Aside from the UM affiliations, faculty, students, alum, it's, been, it's important to have multidisciplinary conversations. So that while we'll get to the introductions, just note that we have faculty from the law school, the School of Public Health, and the School of Information talking about these international and national privacy norms. That to me, as someone who's multidisciplinary as a passion, is really, really important. So with that, Denise, take it away and have some fun. So good afternoon. I'm Denise Anthony. I'm a professor of health management and policy at the, or at the School of Public Health here at the U of M. And I'm delighted to welcome you to our panel on evolving national and international norms in security and privacy. My own work explores issues around privacy and trust in using new technologies for health and in healthcare, and also outside of healthcare, uh, and how they impact individuals as well as the, the users, whether they're you know, physicians or patients or employees in a wellness setting. Um, okay, so today I have the privilege of moderating this terrific panel um, on our evolving global dynamic complex world of technology, laws, policies, behavior, and trying to think through the implications for security and privacy. I'm joined by two leading experts who can help us think about the potential and even real today consequences um, for security and privacy. So I'm gonna very briefly introduce each of them. Then I'm gonna invite them to tell us a little about themselves and maybe to tell us what's keeping them up at night uh, in their concerns about security and privacy. Then I'm gonna pose a couple of questions and we'll have them tell us what they're thinking about. And we're gonna leave time at the end to hear questions from you. So I'm gonna start with Barbara McQuaid, who is professor of practice at the U of M Law School. Prior to coming to U of M from 2010 to 2017, Professor McQuaid served as the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Michigan, where, among other things, she co-chaired its Terrorism and National Security Subcommittee. She has vast experience in these areas as a U.S. Attorney and before that as an Assistant U.S. Attorney in Detroit, and you've likely seen Professor McQuaid in her role as a legal analyst for NBC News and on MSNBC. And she's also regularly quoted and published in places like the Washington Post, the New York Times, uh, Politico, and Foreign Policy. So Professor McQuaid, tell us a little bit about your interests and maybe one or two global security issues that are keeping you up at night. Yeah, thanks very much, Denise. I'm glad to be here. And um, I think cyber security, data privacy, is the most important legal issue that confronts us today and confounds us, and we are still way behind the curve. Um, I worked for 19 years as a federal prosecutor um, handling national security and terrorism cases. We used a number of electronic methods of surveillance and um, investigation in the work that we did, and so that's where my experience lies. And um, I currently teach classes in criminal law and criminal procedure, and also a course in national security and civil liberties, where we talk about uh, the intersection, as I've learned academics like to say, the intersection between national security and civil liberties. And that's really a fascinating uh, study, I think. Um, what keeps me up at night? I, I guess two things that worries me in the cyber realm. One is attacks by foreign adversaries 
on our systems. You know, more and more we are reliant on cybersecurity for our critical infrastructure, power grid, uh, all of the things that we think about in society that have become second nature, the internet of things, artificial intelligence, as we work into autonomous vehicles, uh, with foreign adversaries have the ability to hack into those systems, they can cause incredible chaos and disruption and harm to human life. Um, just last week, there was an attack at a Saudi Arabia chemical plant that is suspected of originating with Russian hackers, and only because the chemical plant had some systems to shut it down when it was hacked did they prevent uh, a very harmful chemical spill into the air in the community that could have been harmful to human life. So uh, I, I don't know that my imagination can even go to all of the places that these uh, threats could pose, but I worry about that. And the other thing I worry about is uh, our foreign adversaries stealing intellectual property through cyber hacking. It's something that I worked on when I was at the US Attorney's Office, and we saw Detroit in particular as a target because of the auto industry and autonomous vehicles and all the research and development that is done here. We had two cases involving theft of trade secrets from major automakers, one involving electrical systems, one involving hybrid technologies, and these are technologies that our auto companies spend many years and many millions of dollars investing in protecting and building building, um, and with one copy of a hard drive or a flash drive or a hack can be in the hands of, in both cases, Chinese competitors who have uh, looked to um, cheat in the competition for this work, and I think harms our national security by diminishing our industrial power around the world. So those are two very serious harms, and both of those are caused by failures of security. And so protecting our security, protecting the privacy of our data is exceptionally important, not only from an individual perspective, but also from a perspective of national security. Great, thank you. And now I'm gonna turn to um, Professor Florian Schaub, who is Assistant Professor of Information in the School of Information, and also in Electrical Engineering and Computer Science in the College of Engineering. Professor Schaub's research focuses on privacy as well as Internet of Things and a lot of other areas of information security and technology. He's interested in empowering users to effectively manage their own privacy and to think about complex socio-technical systems. So Florian, tell us a little bit more about your work and is anything keeping you up at night? Uh, thank you, Denise, and uh, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. That was a great introduction already. Um, so my research really focuses on trying to understand people's privacy and security concerns and behaviors, right? Why, why do people uh, click on phishing links? Um, what can we do to prevent that? We all know no one reads privacy policies, so how can we still provide privacy information to people in a way that is actually meaningful to them, um, provide choices to people ar around privacy that is helpful? Um, we do studies with vulnerable communities. You heard this morning from Alice McDonald, um, who's one of my PhD students and collaborators um, with whom I worked on uh, with undocumented immigrants to understand how communities with objectively higher risks protect their privacy, and what we found is they often fail at that as well. So it's not just a um, motivation question or people not being concerned about the privacy, but it's really the sy systems and the choice architectures that make it pe hard for people to protect their privacy effectively. Um, in terms of what keeps me up at night, I think two aspects. One keeps me up and the other one gives me a little bit of hope. So <laughs> one of the concerns is very similar to what Barb mentioned, which is that we have all this technology around us that is, um, we of course giving information, right? Like people have Facebook, they post to Facebook and so forth, but we also have smartphones in our pockets or right here, um, which have lots of apps who track our location. Um, we have we, we're increasingly more Internet of Things devices in all areas of life, um, and all of them are typically connected to, to a cloud. So there's lots of um, implicit data collection in the background, and it's often not clear how the data is actually used, and there's very little limitations on that. And what gives me hope in that regard a little bit is that uh, we're seeing a lot of effort and activity this year, particularly around uh, privacy legislation. 
So in, in Europe in May, the general data protection regulation went into effect, which actually, despite the biggest lobby activities around any kind of European law, turned out to be a very consumer friendly and um, strong data protection law that really provides strong rights to consumers and protections and kind of tries to limit the, uh, level the playing field between companies, um, state actors and consumers and really give more rights to the consumer and um, give them more agency. Now, one of the challenges where my research comes into this is, while, while it's nice that we say we want to have consumers more agency and we want to give them more choice around privacy, um, actually building technologies and consent mechanisms that are useful and usable is challenging, right? Like no one wants to see cookie notices on every website they go to. And one of the big issues is that we're often thinking about the wrong layer. Um, people don't want to l learn about cookies or consent to cookies. They want to say, I don't want to be tracked for advertising. I don't like this. Right? Um, when, I, when you use my location to show me something um, on Google Maps, um, I'm not agreeing that you can also use that to profile me and f figure out where I live and determine um, what my income, income might be like. Right, so I think um, we, we need to rethink a little bit what we actually mean when we talk about consent. So you can see um, how great these speakers are to help us think through these complex issues. Now the title of the panel um, uses the term norms, and so I should say a little bit about what we're going to mean by that. In this context, we're using the term broadly to mean everything from the everyday pra practices of people on social media, like on Facebook, for example, um, through standard practices that might be used by law enforcement that might be codified into laws or statutes, but also might just be the practices that law enforcement follows for example. Um, and we mean everything up to the international rules and policies that Florian mentioned, like the, um, the EU law, the General Data Protection Regulation uh, that was just enacted this spring, or we could think about recent uh, proposals from the Department of Commerce for the protection of consumer privacy. So some of the more um, major laws and the Department of Commerce proposal, for example, looking for data protections for consumers and offering legal clarity to corporations who, who manage and keep our data. And of course, these different aspects of what we mean by norms all interact with each other as well. So, for example, the changes introduced by the GDPR or by the Department of Commerce for increasing privacy tech protections for citizens have implications for how those citizens behave and whether they are empowered to protect their privacy or um, whether the companies will actually change things that affect how they use some of those technologies. So, Prof Florian, Professor Schaub, <laughs> tell us what you think might be the implications of new policies like the GDPR um, or the Department of Commerce ruling or others for consumers, their practices, and privacy for all of us. Yeah, so, so we have many different laws, as you mentioned, that are just coming out this year, right? So in addition to Europe and the US, we're seeing changes while there's now a consumer protection law in California. I think there's potential movement for federal privacy legislation. Um, we, we also see new privacy laws in other countries. So Brazil just adopted a law that is very similar to the GDPR in August. Um, China this year released um, privacy standards for data handling and securing um, basically how you deal with personal data. Um, I think what the, the implications for consumers in particular are, are very much tied to how these laws are interpreted by companies and also by um, data protection enforcement authorities. So that would be, for example, the Federal Trade Commission here in the United States um, or European data protection authorities in the different European countries. Um, and one of the challenges there is to not just follow the law, but really think about what does it mean to protect privacy? What does it mean to protect personal data? And um, what's the impact of that, um, of privacy unfriendly practices on the relationship between the company and their customers? 
Um, I think there's kind of this notion that, oh, you know, if, if people are unhappy with uh, how Google treats their data, they don't have to use Google. And I think by now we're kind of, we, we're realizing that that's not really a possibility, right? Like, like Google, Facebook, and many of these other services, Amazon, have just become part of, the, of our digital fabric of society, right? Like you can't just opt out of using complete services or complete companies. So I think there's, there's a big responsibility on these companies to protect data and um, personal data in particular. And then, and we can't just rely on, on people saying like, oh, you know, if you give people all the information, then they will make the right decision. No one can read all the privacy policies that you're looking at. Right. There's a great paper from Alicia McDonald and Laurie Craner from 2008 where they uh, estimated that it would take you 220 hours to read all the privacy policies of the websites you encounter in one year. That was 2008. That was before smartphones, that was before mobile apps, that was before uh, smart thermostats and smart speakers. Right? Like Today, this would be much more. So we really need to think about how can we um, better integrate information about privacy and privacy choices into how we actually use technology. And uh, one of the analogies I like there is when, when you use a car, right, the first thing you do is you press a button and you unlock the car, you drive somewhere, you lock the car again, and when you walk away, you've already forgotten if you actually locked the car. And that's, that's a really well integrated security function into how you interact with that technology. Why does it have to be that complicated when you go to Facebook and there are five different pages to change your privacy settings? Interesting. Okay, we're all thinking about that one, I think, still. Um, so, Professor McQuaid, the implications of a change like the GDPR or these others to consumer privacy protections or even clarification for the companies would seem to have implications for law enforcement, for thinking about some of the issues you raised. Um, in doing their work. So could you help us think about that? Yeah, there's definitely a challenge when you think about these two things conceptually. They are sort of directly in contradiction with each other. On the one hand, we have this global platform, the World Wide Web, that permits exchanges with people around the world. It's a wonderful thing from a technology perspective. But there's a disconnect because the laws are governed by the laws of individual countries which are sometimes in conflict with each other. So we get the GDPR, which conflicts with some American laws. Um, in, historically, we've worked out mutual legal assistance treaties with foreign governments that says, here's what we'll give you, here's what we expect in exchange. But now technology has permitted US law enforcement to go get off the World Wide Web a lot of data that can be evidence in cases where we don't need the assistance of former law enforcement officers to give it to us in the way that we did when it was an object that was located in France or in Germany or something like that. In many ways, US law enforcement receives a windfall from the very significant role that US companies play in technology. Google and Microsoft and Amazon are the companies that are international in scope, but have all of that data that gets routed right here through the United States. And so law enforcement takes that and uses it as evidence. But now, to the extent Europeans are involved in this, uh, and that's the data that is being obtained, and it's in direct conflict with the GDPR, what do these companies do? They want to comply with US law enforcement, but they might be in violation of the GDPR. And I'll, I'll give you a couple of examples, um, some very simple ones. One is there is a website that is used all the time in law enforcement and in computer investigations called whois.net. And by going to whois.net, you can find out who is the owner of any domain name. If you say, who is umich.edu, it will tell you it is the University of Michigan. And it'll tell you their address and where it's maintained. It'll give you all kinds of information about that. Under the GDPR, who is arguably is illegal. And so can that continue to exist? Can you get it for other domain names that exist around the world? How's that gonna work post GDPR? But it's an incredibly valuable tool that gets used by investigators. Uh, that's probably the simplest example. Um, another example is the Cloud Act that was enacted in just uh, earlier this year. And this was as a result of a case 
where the government went to Microsoft to get data from an email account with a valid search warrant, and Microsoft said, we'd love to help you, but we can't because the data is being uh, stored in Ireland, and your search warrant only gives me permission to give you data that's stored in the United States. In response to that case, Congress passed something called the Cloud Act that says if U.S. companies store data overseas, that search warrant can reach overseas to get that information. That could also be in violation of the GDPR, which says that uh, law enforcement should comply with foreign agreements, but no foreign government has agreed that there can be extraterritorial reach of a search warrant. And so that is arguably no longer uh, valid under the GDPR. And then finally, the most complex of these questions is uh, foreign intelligence collection under the FISA laws, the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act. There is a part of that added in recent years called Section 702 that permits the government to collect communications content of non-US persons overseas, largely taking advantage of the fact that those communications get routed through the United States. It does not require an order of a court. That data is collected and exploited for foreign intelligence purposes. Again, collecting that contact and that transfer may be in violation of the GDPR. So what do we do about that with these companies that are trying to comply with US law and now with the GDPR? I don't know the answer to that. Um, I think that in many ways, the technology companies are gonna have to comply with the most restrictive protections, but what do you do when they are in direct conflict with each other? Can we anymore have a World Wide Web that will continue to serve the world, uh, but comply with the specific laws of each individual country? Yeah, maybe if I can comment on that. So I think one of the big differences between the US approach towards privacy and the European approach to privacy is that in Europe, privacy is a human right. It's part of the, of the European Charter defined as a right that citizens have. So the, the GDPR is an implementation of that. And it doesn't matter if you're a European citizen or just someone passing through Europe. If you're Europe, you're under the GDPR protection. And I think some of the, the points you mentioned, but like I, I definitely see the tensions with our US laws as well as with um, law enforcement needs to some extent. But I think there are also really serious privacy concerns with some of the data collection that has been going on. So you mentioned the Whois database, right, which um, is, is a useful service for, for certain aspects, but at the same time, um, when you're registering a domain name, I went through this not too long ago for actually a phishing experiment we went through, so we, um, <laughs> we registered some kind of bogus e uh, web addresses, but uh, that's kind of besides the point, right? But um, what, what, we, what happened is, Basically, a few days after I signed up for this website, I've been getting calls. Like, we want to, um, on my office phone number, um, this is your Google search specialist, and we would like to help you um, be higher in the Google rankings, right? And the way where they get this information from is partially the Whois databases and the domain registrars sharing that information freely because you can't opt out of that properly. And what the GDPR gives you is the right to restrict that this information is public in the first place. Um, and uh, similarly with uh, the, the the Pfizer Act, right? So I, th I think it, it is kind of uh, challenging that, or, that, or uh, I find it concerning that U.S. intelligence services have the authority to collect data about foreign uh, foreign individuals. I'm a foreign individual um, without any kind of very little oversight, right? So I think I think that's a really big challenge, and I think the GDPR makes it harder. Um, to, to continue doing that um, if U.S. businesses want to continue doing, uh, companies want to continue doing business in Europe. Like uh, one of the kind of interesting connection points is that the GDPR also prevents, it, it prohibits the, the, the transfer from da of data from Europe to other countries unless um, there are uh, similar adequate protections in that, company, in that country. And um, between the US and Europe, we have something called the Privacy Shield, which um, is meant to kind of arbitrate some of these uh, uh, inc like conflicts between the different laws and uh, as well as take care of the surveillance aspects a little bit. Um, but whether that's still valid, yeah, I think that's gonna be something the European uh, Court of Justice will probably decide in the next few years.
So I think this um, disagreement, these different points of views, raise some of the other implications about um, the, the changing legal regimes as well as the changing technologies and behaviors of um, people and different kinds of users as well as the companies in adapting to this. And um, the, we, each of you have raised them in different ways, the implications for surveillance. A little earlier today, we heard from Cindy Cohn from the Electronic Frontier Foundation discussing some of these kinds of issues. And it, it's not just about laws and rights, it's also then the implications for national security that Barbara, you've raised in, in your comments. So there's law enforcement, but then there are national security kind of interests. I wonder if you could draw those out a little more for us. Yeah, so with regard to um, surveillance, as you mentioned, how things are evolving so rapidly and the law is always a step behind the technology. Uh, you know, we'll see a, a, a change in the law maybe several years after some kind of technology has evolved. And so what law enforcement officials do is try to apply a new technology to an old law using like, for example, by analogy, how do we get phone records to compare it to internet records? And it's never quite a perfect fit. We just had a, a big Supreme Court case that we saw here in the United States uh, just this past summer, a case called Carpenter versus the United States that I think is a good example about how technology moves faster than the law and how it's really changed things up for law enforcement. This was a case that actually arose out of the Eastern District of Michigan when I was the U.S. Attorney out of Detroit uh, where a man was charged with being involved in a number of armed robberies. And one of the techniques that was used in this case and many others since this technology has been uh, available is to use cell site location data as evidence of someone's whereabouts. And so for this man, an order was obtained that permits transactional phone data to be obtained from phone companies with a court order based on a fairly low level of evidence, not as much as the probable cause standard that would be required for a search warrant, slightly more than a subpoena, but just reasonable, specific and articulable grounds to show that it's reasonable to obtain this information. So fairly low standard. Those records were obtained for the defendant, put him at the scene of the robberies on all of the occasions, and that was part of the evidence that was used to convict him at trial. The case worked its way up to the Supreme Court, and the argument was that because this data collection is so intrusive, a search warrant would, should be required before the government can obtain this data. Um, and the Supreme Court agreed. And it's very interesting to see how they've made a real shift in the doctrine. In the past, the way the court thought about these third-party records, that is the records of a phone company or a bank or some other third party, not a party to the legal case, either the defendant or the, the government in the case of a criminal prosecution, Records in the hands of a third party belong to that third party. After all, they're their records. They created them for a legitimate business purpose. And the person about uh, whose, whose data is reflected in those records does not have any reasonable expectation of privacy in those records. And that is where the third party doctrine has always been thought of. Instead, the Supreme Court has taken a different look and said, it's not really the records we're so concerned about. It's the data contained within the records. Um, so the first time made sort of an exception to this third party doctrine and said, we're not getting rid of the third party doctrine, but in this case, this data was so intrusive. It is 24 seven, it can pinpoint the location. Um, it is pervasive, it is near perfect surveillance, completely different from the kind of surveillance you could do with another human, that we're gonna look not so much now instead of this bright line of the fact that these are in the hands of a third party, but instead we're gonna look at the nature of the data and how intrusive it is, and we're also gonna look at the voluntariness of your sharing this data. Because it's automatic that your cell phone sends this signal up to the cell tower and can pinpoint your location in a way very different from the way we've traditionally thought about the data we've shared with third parties, we're gonna treat this differently. But then the court said, we're gonna frame this very narrowly. This is not gonna apply to other kinds of records. This is not gonna apply to national security cases. It's very, very narrow. 
it really leaves the landscape without a lot of clarity. So if you're a law enforcement professional and you want to investigate the next bank robbery cases or armed robbery cases, and you want to capture some other kind of data, where is that line going to be drawn going forward? And instead, it looks like it might be more of a case-by-case -case basis, which is much harder uh, for people to know what the rules are in advance. And so um, I think uh, we are seeing a change in the law. We are seeing courts consider these things differently, but it leaves a lot of questions unanswered about how to do someone's job going forward. Do you want to speculate on the surveillance implications of that? Um, earlier, as I mentioned, when Cindy Cohn was talking, she was worried about that balance and thinking that citizens are really at risk of losing some core rights protected in the United States um, and giving that too much to government or to third parties, relying on the, the companies to enforce that. What do you think? Uh, yes, especially when it comes to things like we just talked about, third party records, it really requires the third party, the service provider, whether it's the phone company or the, you know, the Facebooks of the world and Amazons of the world, uh, to step up. Though many of them have, Apple has been a strong advocate of privacy, and I think in many ways it sells its products on the basis of we are here to protect your privacy. So in some ways they're monetizing <laughs> that interest, but, uh, but nonetheless they play an important role there. Some of the times in some of these cases, it has been the service provider that has raised the legal challenge to say, I think this is an overreach government and we need clarity in this issue. For example, Apple uh, refused to comply with a subpoena or a search warrant provided uh, from the government when the FBI was investigating the San Bernardino terrorist incident, for example. And because the phone was encrypted, the FBI was not able to open it, even though they had a valid search warrant from a judge that said, you may search the contents of this phone, the phone that belonged to uh, the male attacker in that San Bernardino terrorist attack. But Apple said, we can't crack it. Uh, the FBI went to a judge and said, got a search warrant that actually directed Apple to write the code to crack the phone without erasing the data on it, which will happen with 10 failed password attempts. Um, and even once it got it, Apple said, no, we refuse, and they, they challenged that search warrant in court. Um, and there was a legal battle about that. FBI calls this problem going dark, the inability to surveil targets because of encryption, whether it's on what, WhatsApp and these end-to-end -end encryption texting services or encrypted telephone content. Um, and that battle continued until FBI actually found a white hat ha hacker who was willing to open it for them before they got resolution of that issue. But that's another kind of issue where I think more and more consumers are having to rely on the service providers, the apples of the world, to fight these legal battles so that we can get that sort of clarity resolved in the courts. So Florian, what do you think about that? The, the idea of the third parties having to be the protector of consumer privacy, the role of the consumer or the citizen in, in trying to manage privacy in the face of government actions, legal changes, and, and third party behavior. Yeah, I, I think the, this is a real challenge, right? Like the, the third parties kind of, or the, the service providers becoming kind of kind of almost guardians of people's privacy, like that puts a lot of trust and responsibility on public enti uh, private entities, and not all of them warrant that trust, I think. Um, one, one issue I see is, right, so, so the reason why law enforcement is so, so interested in all of this data is because Traditionally, they had access to the data because there was very little encryption and security in place. It was very easy to, you know, take a computer, take a phone, uh, copy that content, potentially even without the, sub the suspect being aware of it. And um, the, the increased deployment of en encryption makes it harder. And I, I can understand the, frust the frustration from the law enforcement side with that, but it, it, on the other hand, um, it's, it's not like when someone has a lock installed in their house or um, extra secure windows installed in their house, then the lock manufacturer doesn't have to uh, work with law enforcement to crack that lock, right? Like the law enforcement has all the means to try to break into the house if they want to, 
but the service provider, the lock maker, doesn't have to com have to work with them to do that. And I think that the request to Apple to write code to circumvent the security of their phone is just very dangerous. It's a very dangerous notion because um, it's not just that single phone. It's not just like breaking into one phone. It's breaking into all iPhones at, at once, right? Once that code is there, that it can be used in, in different cases. And actually, has actually taken steps since this the San Bernardino case to make it even harder for themselves to be able to provide code that could do that. Um, so, so I think I think it's challenging. Like, like there's also this whole discussion about um, in, encryption backdoors. Can we can we build kind of key escrow into systems so that there's a law enforcement key? Um, but but um, yeah. But, but the, I think the, the the problem with the with, with the backdoors is right. Uh, cryptography is based on math, and the the mathematics are out there. And right? so so even if you require Apple, Microsoft, Google to have backdoors in their systems, nothing prevents someone from building a, a different version of a, of a mobile operating system, for example, that still has strong encryption and um, for for criminals to then use that or for terrorists to use that. So I think we, we always need to think of, uh, Cindy used the term earlier, proportionality, right? Like what, what's really the, the effect on the privacy of um, consumers and citizens and what are the advantages for law enforcement? And we, need, we, need, we think we need, we need to think more about how we can balance those two in a way that is actually effective. In the face of that, what hope do we as consumers, not mathematicians, uh, in, in protecting our own pa our privacy or even approaching the use of these data? Is, is it all lost? No, I don't think so, right? So, so I think we, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that anything we do leaves digital traces nowadays. It's extremely hard to go through the world without leaving traces behind. Um, some of those traces you can control to some extent. So you can use ad blockers to prevent from uh, gazillion advertising companies to learn which websites you're using every day. Um, I don't think anyone has a problem with the fact that um, a news website um, needs to make money and uses advertising to do that but it seems a little bit disingenuous to then have invite 20 other companies to basically watch which website you're looking at and keep track of that and then follow you around the internet just because you went to one particular website, right? Like that's a really strange approach of saying like, hey, it's our business model. Um, so, so I think there needs to be like, like a little bit more um, of a leveled conversation between consumer needs for privacy and companies' needs for business or law enforcement need for data access. And I think um, we, we need to um, have a better conversation about that. And the GDPR, I think, is one step in that right direction. And it's interesting to see how more and more companies are actually building their own privacy laws on um, either the GDPR or the European Data Protection Directive, which was kind of the precursor of the GDPR. And um, California just recently, with their very strong consumer, uh, well, so California has a new Consumer Protection Act, which was basically uh, uh, enacted within two days. So they're still kind of uh, fixing all the drafting issues <laughs> with that particular law. Um, but one of the things that uh, this law would offer to consumers when it goes into effect is that websites have to place a button on the start page that says, do not sell my data, um, and a, a clear opt-out. Um, whether this will actually be how it will be implemented, we will see. But I think um, we, we need to make more use of our opt-out rights, and we need to demand more rights and more consistency also in the privacy protections. Yeah, and I'll just add that it's, it's challenging when states are enacting privacy laws, because right. the, in the same way when you have different countries with different rules, if you also have different states with different rules, it makes it very difficult for a company like Facebook or Amazon or whomever to, to uh, uh, to comply with those rules. And so um, I would say the federal legislation is probably what we need and where we're headed. You know, you've seen Mark Zuckerberg and all these CEOs going to Congress and talking about, we'll get our own house in order. You don't need to, nothing to see here, folks. Um, I think that the time is likely coming when we 
probably do need federal legislation to talk about those kinds of things. Uh, when you think about what Facebook was permitting with Cambridge Analytica and some of these other companies uh, to gather our information so that they could build profiles about all of us, um, you know, I think that's something that probably requires some regulation. Um, and as Florian said, who has time to read all of those various terms of service agreements? You know, I click agree as quickly as I can and move on to the next screen. Uh, and I'm sure most consumers behave that way. But uh, we are agreeing to give all kinds of data to people who are building all kinds of profiles on us. And we ought, uh, at least ought to know that and agree to that before we allow that to happen. Um, they're certainly using it for marketing purposes. You know, when you go on your computer, you find out uh, all the things you'd like to buy, and they're right. Amazon suggests books you would like to read, and yes, I would. Um, but they're collecting all kinds of stuff about us and building all kinds of profiles about us. And uh, I, I think some of us may continue to agree to let Amazon uh, suggest books to us or Spotify to suggest music to us. But there's probably other sites that we would not allow them to collect our information for. And I don't think that we can trust industry to do that for us. I think we probably need Congress to come up with a national solution as opposed to a state-by-state -state solution. Um, I, th I think this trust aspect is also really interesting, right? Because, I, I, as you said, most people don't have an issue with Amazon recommending books to them or Spotify recommending new mu music to them. Like, the, the tracking is kind of built into the service and it serves a purpose. Like, you have a benefit from that. but. When you look at an Amazon product, there are also additional third-party trackers on that website that also look at which um, product you're looking at and which products you're browsing, and they build profiles about you. And you have no idea who these companies are. Right? Like you, you have a, you, if you install a browser extension like Ghostory, for example, and you look at the list of trackers, like these are companies you've never heard of, you have no relationship with. And it's these uh, context violations, the data kind of being uh, shared with entities who don't even know who they are, that really concerns people. And I think when we talk about privacy concerns, I think one of the, the main aspects that shapes concerns is the uncertainty. People don't know what this data is being used for, and Honestly, some people also like the imagination of what data can be, can be used for. So I think it's a question of edu educating people about what the privacy risks are and making them clearer, but then at the same time also having stronger legislation that prevents that. And I, I agree, like, we, we can't have 50 different privacy laws. It's going to be terrible for industry. And at the same time, well, what's kind of interesting is also that all these big US companies, they are already adhering to the GDPR. They have systems in place that are compliant with the GDPR that, that follow this because they still want to do business in Europe. But it's kind of up to them whether they also, as US companies, make those benefits available to US consumers. And that seems like a very strange situation to be in. And I think just one more point about uh, all of these other issues is that the individual consumer can't other than opting out of using the technology at all, which is really not a possibility, can't protect their privacy because they can't make decisions or it, because they might not be aware, but they don't even have the power or capacity to change how Google is allowing third parties on or Facebook uh, use of their data. And so it's not something that an individual consumer has the capacity to do that suggests there's a role for government to make that um, to, to regulate that in a way. Um, so I think we've heard a lot of exciting, important, maybe scary issues um, to think about, and we'd like to open it up to all of you to hear your questions or concerns for Barbara and Florian. Hello. Um, so there's been a lot of talk on this panel about federal re uh, legislation, and I was curious about two streams of thought uh, given the sectoral approach in the United States um, and also the state variation. Um, given federal legislation, uh, do you believe that there'll be uh, that pr uh, potential legislation would fill in the gaps um, or override and provide uh, like cross industry protections? And furthermore, looking at emerging technologies and how to kind of future-proof this legislation as uh, the abilities of technology change, uh, yet continue to preserve uh, privacy at a similar level. 
say, federal regulation that might come about, will that be able to address issues across industries? So you might regulate it in consumer retail, but would that apply to healthcare or would that apply to banking or something like that? Yeah, that's kind of the situation we have at the moment. We have um, financial privacy laws, we have health-related privacy laws, we have laws that protect children online, um, and I think one of the worst things we could be doing is having a law that regulates online services. Rather, what we really need is a, a comprehensive privacy law that is technology agnostic to some extent. Um, like, we don't want to have the same discussion in five years when we're talking about autonomous vehicles or the next, um, like, like, I don't know, the, the smart grid and, and other systems, right? Like, we can't be chasing the next technology. I think we're, we're at a point where we need to realize that any technology has data implications, has privacy implications, and we, we need a law that protects privacy in general, um, and then also gives all kinds of companies and industries a clear target um, in terms of what are the requirements they have to fulfill. Like right now, it's not just that you, as a company, you need to understand the federal laws, you need to keep an eye on the state laws around privacy, you also need to keep an eye on federal, the Federal Trade Commission's uh, enforcement actions to see like what other companies have been dinged for and whether that's something you might be at risk as well. So it's, um, it would actually create a lot of clarity for companies if we would have a single privacy law. Yeah, I think it's a great idea to try to come up with something that will endure evolving technology, but you often do see different rules for different types of industries and different types of records. Uh, medical records often get additional protections, financial records often get additional protections, and I think sometimes that is dictated by uh, as much by logic as by who's got the better lobbying presence uh, in Congress, unfortunately. But you know, they talk about it as uh, the sausage getting made. There's compromise and give and take in all of these uh, bills that become laws. And so I don't know that we can expect there to be one unifying privacy law, though I think it would be a useful way at least to start in hopes that you wouldn't have to revise the law every year as technology evolves. Although I bet you will, looking at FISA, for example, which was first enacted in 1978, there have been so many technological changes that it has been amended many, many times just to keep up with technology in ways that people just can't envision. Like this idea of cell site location information. In 1978, nobody thought of it. And so I, I, I don't imagine that we'll ever be done with developing laws around technology and privacy, but, but I do agree that it would be useful to think through in broad terms so that you don't have to amend it every year, because as we can see, it can be often be very difficult to get Congress to agree on things. Um, I had a question regarding loopholes specifically within laws and whether or not we're really worried about it. If we look at the food industry as an example, you can get manufacturers saying that um, there's no fat in this, or there's no sugar, or something like that, and it's not actually true, it's just below a certain percentage. Are we worried about um, companies saying, we don't sell your data when really it's just, we only sell like 10 out of every thousand people's worth of data? <laughs> Yeah, so, so we, we actually have loopholes like that in, in our current privacy laws already. Um, so COPPA, which is the Children Online's Privacy Protection Act, says that um, if, if services um, are addressing children um, 14 and younger, um, there are additional requirements. You need parental consent, for example. Right? So what companies are doing is, almost all of them say, our services are not for children. <laughs> Right. If, if you under, like, if you look at a privacy policy, it always has a paragraph about children's rights, and it says, if you are under 14, you're not allowed to use this service. And then they have nice and poppy colors and cartoon characters that are clearly targeted at kids younger than, than 14, but because they write that in their privacy policy, they're basically falling outside of copper pr protections. I'll, I'll just add to that that um, loopholes are what lawyers do. <laughs> Lawyers get paid huge fees to find loopholes to, and counsel their clients on great ways to make money by avoiding the technical language of a law. Prosecutors make tiny salaries proving that companies intended to violate the law 
by finding loopholes. Um, and so how do you prevent people from taking a shot at a loophole? You have to have a significant enough penalty to deter them from taking that risk. And so I would say in any proposed legislation, you would need to include some sufficient penalty that would scare companies off risking a, a wrong interpretation of a loophole. And I think that's one of the reasons why everyone's talking about the GDPR at the moment, because uh, this threat of fines up to 4% um, of your global annual revenue, that's, that has teeth, right? Like people are paying attention to that and are really thinking about, okay, what do I need to do to comply with that law so that I don't get hit with those fines? So I have two questions. Um, we have this interesting issue in healthcare in HIPAA where uh, doctors, offices, hospitals, uh, and, and other organizations are allowed to self-certify themselves as being secure. Um, and as, as an information security professional, um, oftentimes I look at the measures they, they have decided are secure and um, wonder what reality they're operating in. Um, which leads me to wonder, are we going to see um, maybe uh, an elimination of this provision and conversion to certification via auditing agencies? Um, do you see any, any movement in that direction? It's interesting just this discussion in that HIPAA started as a floor and states could have privacy, health privacy laws or protections that were stronger than HIPAA when HIPAA first went into effect. And so it's a sort of an interesting comparison to this issue of the 50 states with different laws. And I think that's some way to push in that direction, HIPAA established the floor, and then eventually states came to comply and have similar laws. Now that's not your question, which is about how well the provider organizations like the healthcare or insurers or others are in securing that data. And I think in many ways, healthcare with, with no, um, offense meant to all the fabulous people here in our health system uh, securing the data. Healthcare was very behind other industries, if you look at finance, for example. And I think it's taken quite a, a long time to introduce those standards into the systems that exist in healthcare. Um, and we, there is still a long way to go. And it's not just in the systems, it's in the practices and the, the organizational policies that exist in healthcare, where their primary goal is not management of data. It is delivering care and quality care to patients. And so that's a big challenge. Um, unlike in the technology companies who recognize the data is their most important asset or finance where that data is extremely valuable, they've taken a lot more steps um, to, to protect their own information security, and I think healthcare has a ways to go to catch up. Uh, my question is, how are these regulations and laws enforced across international boundaries um, with stuff like GDPR and Brazil and China, California for state boundaries? Yeah, so, so one interesting aspect of the GDPR is kind of its uh, extraterritorial application, right? Like the reason why US companies are worried about GDPR is that um, you don't have to operate in Europe. Um, the GDPR applies as soon as you are processing data about people in Europe. Um, and I, th I think we will see more of that. So Brazil's law, for example, has something as well. Um, if, you are, um, if you're processing data about people in Brazil, you have to adhere to, to the Brazilian law. And kind of goes back to this notion of privacy as a human right. Um, and you know, it shouldn't matter where the person sits that is making use of your data or processing the data. It's your right that your data is protected and that your privacy is protected. Um, so that's just something we, we need to be cognizant of. And it's, it's relatively easy to keep track of where data requests are coming from, at, at least uh, to some extent, right? So you, based on IP addresses, you can judge whether a request is coming from Europe, whether a request is coming um, from Brazil or from the United States. But I think 
ideally we want to really get to a level where there are, um, there's an international standard um, that, that's at, le at least of compatible laws. Um, so I think if the US would come up with a, with a um, comprehensive privacy law that is very different from GDPR, that wouldn't help anyone. Right? Like I think there needs to be um, consistency between these laws, and um, there, are, there are efforts in place to trying to achieve this. For, so for example, in the Asia-Pacific Economic Re Region, APEC, there's uh, so something called the APEC Privacy Framework. Um, and so APEC involves lots of Asian countries, China, um, Japan, Korea, um, but also the United States, Canada, Mexico. Um, and it's kind of like a, a, a code of conduct regarding privacy that different countries can subscribe to and that way kind of um, make international collaboration or cooperation around data transfer as well as privacy enforcement easier. I mean, can a European court sue a US company and how does that work is more of the question. Under what jurisdiction or what court would enforce this? Yeah, I think if they're doing business in uh in Europe, then they would be susceptible. So if you've got Amazon doing business in Europe or Facebook doing business in Europe, that would lend them to susceptibility to the jurisdiction there. So they would have to comply with the GDPR with respect to their European customers. Or sees doing business in Europe. <laughs> and I think some people have speculated that that might trickle through the US because large companies who do business in Europe will comply and that will then change the playing field for lots of those industries, those companies in the US and it's possible other US companies, even if they don't do business in Europe, might come to comply. I think though that gap might also be a, a space that we have to live in for a while and that might create even more challenges. Yeah, so talked a little bit about law enforcement and how there's been some potential overreaches of, of accessing personal data. So if, if you look through um, GDPR and almost if you spent the 200 hours reading all of the privacy policies, just about every one of them are going to have an exclusion for complying with law enforcement or some relevant regulation. So do you see privacy laws as, as more protection uh, consumer protection or protection against law enforcement? Because there's, there, in, 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 at least in my mind, there's always going to be a role that the company, Apple for exa example, has to step in and say, this violates our core principles and we're going to fight it out in court because we don't, we don't believe in, in what you're asking for. So maybe just your thoughts generally on the law enforcement piece. So to, to the extent I understand the question, I think you said, do you see laws as protecting the privacy of consumers from, pri from companies or protecting consumers from law enforcement? Yeah, is that the, your question? The primary role, yes. Yeah. Well, I, I guess I don't frame it as one versus the other. I, I frame it as protecting of uh, data security, data integrity, and I think that protects both the consumer and national security by protecting us from data hacks from foreign adversaries. So I think it can do both. Uh, there are processes in place with search warrants, court orders, uh, and court oversight that I think exist to protect consumers and companies from government overreach. But I suppose as data evolves, courts will have to confront the questions of, what kind of legal process are we going to require for each of these evolving types of technology? And so I imagine we will need amendments on a fairly regular basis to uh, what's called the Stored Communications Act that deals with a lot of uh, the data privacy that we have. Because, you know, for example, the cell site location information, that was one that it just didn't fit neatly into any category. There's one provision that talks about transactional data, and cell site location has always been thought of as transactional data. But what the court said in that case is, even though it's transactional data, it's kind of quasi-content, because if I know where you are every minute of the day, I can kind of put together who you are and what you're doing. They call it the mosaic theory. 
and it can tell me many of the most private things about you, that you go to the massage parlor, that you go to the par political party headquarters, that you are going to your mistress's house. And if I pull this all together, I can paint a content-rich picture of that transactional data. So I don't know that we're ever gonna be done settling on what these data privacy laws look like, but I think we will continue to evolve in terms of what kinds of protections we're going to require before we permit law enforcement to have this information. Um, maybe shortly. So uh, what's also interesting to keep in mind is that um, the GDPR and other laws almost always have carve-outs for um, complying with law enforcement or with other laws that regulate uh, law enforcement, and they're typically separate laws that, that manage that. Um, so I think most privacy laws are primarily meant to protect the consumer, and, but as Barb said, that means the consumer with regards to the company as well as to the government, but then there are exceptions under which um, co uh, cooperation with law enforcement might be required, and um, I think it's it's, important to also have those exceptions, but also look at what those exceptions actually entail and how big the loopholes and gaps are that, that are created by those. So I'm sorry, we are out of time. And uh, so I'd just like to ask you to join me in thanking our panelists. So first I want to thank the team that helps put this together, Joel, uh, and Kim, wherever you are in particular, but it obviously takes a village to put on a full day's event like this, so thank you one and all. I wanna thank all of our speakers, um, and particularly you, the audience, for your participation and your engagement throughout the day. So I hope you learned a lot today. Um, and more than just learned, I hope you learned about not just the subject matter, but the rich work and important work that's going on at the University of Michigan itself in the fields of IT security and privacy. And Again, to reiterate, as compelling as the work itself is, I appreci appreciate hearing from so many different colleges, departments, and disciplines. So just as sort of a refresher, we started the day with a computer engineer talking about threats that inhabit the sensors that are part of our everyday world. We moved on to an engineering graduate student who's actually doing social science research into privacy and security concerns and practices of at-risk populations. We had someone from the school, faculty member from the School of Nursing who's innovating in anonymizing data uh, to work in big data in, for, uh, in an effort to find new discoveries in the healthcare uh, field. And finally, we just had a wonderful panel um, about looking from three different schools, from the School of Public Health, from the School of Information, from the law school, looking at evolving norms in, in privacy and IT security uh, across the world. And don't forget our keynote. Uh, that's a law school alum and who happens to lead one of the world's leading privacy and internet freedom advocacy organizations. That's the sort of power that we have at the University of Michigan to pull these sorts of intellectual resources together and, and it's why this place is so special. This is a sort of public engagement that is part of the U of M mission. So I hope Summit 18 did its part to serve the people of Michigan and this is quoting from our own mission statement at the university through preeminence in creating, communicating, preserving and applying knowledge art and academic values, and in developing leaders and citizens who will challenge the present and enrich the future. Join us in the lobby for reception. Thank you, and let's continue the conversation.